In this lecture, we look at the revolution, starting 500 years ago, that transformed our view of our place in the universe. Let's go back to Europe in the time of the Renaissance. Renaissance, incidentally, means rebirth. The scientific revolution in Europe was preceded by a revolution in thinking, where the tight strictures of the Catholic Church were loosened. People began to be more naturalistic in their depiction of humans in art. Their ceremonial objects were no longer strictly dedicated to religion. Society was still religious, but it became more secular around the edges, and science could move into this space. Meanwhile, the view of the universe was strictly Greek. It was a relic of the ideas and the thinking of Aristotle, who had declared that the Earth was immobile at the center of the universe, since obviously no motion was apparent, and therefore the Earth was the only planet in the universe. The center of a universe, with the planets orbiting around us, the sun and the moon, and then the fixed stars attached to a crystalline sphere. The nature of that material was uncertain to the Greeks. However, momentum was building slowly. This was not a quick revolution. For a heliocentric model, for the idea that the Earth was in motion and was not the center of the universe. The resistance to this idea, just based on common sense, the fact that people knew how large the Earth was. So if the Earth spun once a day, then obviously people at a mid-northern latitude would have to be moving at hundreds of miles per hour, and nobody felt that motion. This was the Greek objection to the Earth being in motion. And that objection hadn't gone away, but gradually evidence was being accumulated that would make a heliocentric more natural. Another innovation that happened and that was a prerequisite for any scientific revolution was the ability to exchange information. Remember that five or six hundred years ago, travel throughout Europe or in the New World was extremely difficult and dangerous. It could literally take months to go from one country to another. Travel by sea was just as dangerous, with storms, no good ways of navigating, with pirates, and so on. The innovation that happened starting in the mid-1400s was that of the printing press, Gutenberg. The way that we could suddenly reproduce manuscripts that had previously been written painstakingly by hand and then propagate them around a whole continent was an acceleration in the spread of knowledge. And this was essential to what happened in science in the subsequent centuries. The Copernican Revolution is a reference, of course, to Nicholas Copernicus. He was a minor cleric in the Catholic Church living in Poland when he recognized that it was more elegant to have the sun at the center of the solar system. The thing that was unnatural about a geocentric cosmology was the fact that certain planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, occasionally do retrograde motion which is, they appear to momentarily, or for a few weeks or months, reverse their forward migration through the stars, back up for a few months, and then continue their forward motion. Alone among the planets, these planets do retrograde motion, and it's very puzzling. And in a geocentric model, it has no natural explanation. If you allow the Earth to be in motion around the Sun and all the other planets, moving at different speeds around the Sun, you can have an easy situation where the interior planet, the Earth, overtakes Mars or Jupiter or Saturn, moving faster on the inside, and so as seen from the perspective of the Earth, you can have retrograde motion. That's just one reason why the heliocentric model took play. There were also mathematical and logical arguments suggesting, and these went back to Greek times, that the Sun was much larger than the Earth. And to thinkers of that time, it was illogical for the larger object to go around the smaller object. So, momentum was building for a Copernican revolution. But it's called a revolution in both sense of the words, not just because his book was called on the revolutions, meaning the motions and revolving the sun around the earth or the celestial objects, but also the social sense of that word, violent political and social upheaval. The Copernican revolution was a profound shift in perspective and thinking. By displacing the Earth from the center of the universe and a unique situation of importance, you open the vision for other celestial objects for a sense of how large the universe might truly be. Remember that in a heliocentric perspective, the Earth is in motion. One of the implications of the Earth being in motion is that the stars must be very far away. Because in the Greek geocentric model, the Earth is the center of the universe, and the stars are attached to a celestial sphere, always moving at the same distance, 
So of course the stars never change their relative positions and they always appear at the same brightness. In a heliocentric model where the Earth is in motion, wherever the stars are, the Earth must be getting nearer and further from some stars as the season rolls by. And yet we don't see any change in the relative angles of stars, the parallax effect, or in their brightness, just caused by the fact that the light source appears to brighten when you get closer to it. The absence of any parallax effect for the stars, or apparent brightness change in the bright stars, meant that the stars had to be incredibly far away. So another implication of the heliocentric model was that the universe was much larger than the Greeks had imagined. All of these ideas and the things that tie them together are, of course, the grist of the scientific method. And perhaps the most influential thinker giving us the modern scientific method was a man who lived around the time of Shakespeare in England, Francis Bacon. The book he published in 1620 essentially formalizes what we would recognize even today as the basis of the scientific method, a linear logical practice for conducting experiments. Bacon also addressed what he called the weakness of the human mind, the fact that bias is possible in experimenters and that you have to be careful of your modes of thinking to honestly represent what's happening in nature. So Bacon recognized that science must minimize not only human error or mistakes, but also human misconceptions and wrong-headed thinking. Bacon also advocated strongly for inductive reasoning over deductive reasoning. We can look at this in a little more detail because it's important to how modern science works. Deductive reasoning and the rules for it came from Aristotle 2,500 years ago. The model is called a syllogism in logic. This draws specific conclusions from general premises that are assumed to be true. So in deduction, you have premises. And if the premises are justified, the argument is valid and the logic is good. The key is that the premises have to be justified. So if you can't justify the premises, deductive reasoning essentially falls apart. In one example, the sun moving across the sky in a daily cycle is a premise, and that's indeed observed. Another premise, however, from Aristotle, is that the Earth is the unmoving center of the universe. The conclusion drawn from those two premises is that the sun moves around the Earth, the geocentric model. Well, one of the premises is simply wrong, and so the argument falls apart. So the dangers of deductive reasoning were clear, even at Greek times, but there wasn't much evidence or observation to bring to the table. Induction works in a different way. It essentially draws general conclusions from evidence, pieces of observational data. The problem and the limitation of induction is that a general conclusion is being drawn from a finite amount of data. And the question then devolves to how much is enough data? Do you have enough data to generalize your conclusion? The example from Newton's law of gravity is, of course, that he called it a universal law of gravity. Newton's law was developed to explain the orbits of the planets in the solar system, and it did this exquisitely well. And as we've seen, Edmund Halley used Newton's law to calculate the return of Halley's comet, a highly elliptical orbiting comet whose motion nonetheless followed Newton's law precisely and beautifully. But Newton's law is saying something more. It's saying that objects as yet undiscovered, or new classes of objects, will also follow this universal law of gravity. So nobody knew about binary stars or exoplanets at the time of Newton's law. They were only discovered a few decades ago. And yet Newton's law describes their orbits perfectly well. Nobody knew about galaxies or clusters of galaxies until the 1920s and 30s. And yet the orbits of galaxies around each other, or the orbits of galaxies in superclusters and clusters, also follows Newton's law. It's a stunningly successful example of induction, of a finite set of observations, a theory or hypothesis developed to explain them, and then projected to a much larger physical situation in the universe. That is the power of modern science. But the foundation of science recognized by the Greeks, but not truly practiced by them, and essential at the time of the Copernican Revolution, is that evidence is the source of all knowledge. We must make observations of the natural world and follow the evidence where it may lead. And that's still true of science today. So we have the concept of evidence-based reasoning 
by which we can understand the natural world and make theories about the natural world. In observing the natural world, the individual or the scientist should be dispassionate and objective and not bring their own predispositions, preconceptions, or biases to the table. There's no arbitrary human tendency that can short-circuit the scientific method. Another key component of the scientific method with evidence at the base is that evidence has to be reproducible. It's not enough to do a single experiment and then fail to replicate it the next week or the next year. It's actually important that not only an experimenter replicate their experiment, but that other experimenters do so too, until the community of scientists using common ideas and common methods all agree on the data. They may not agree on its interpretation, that's where scientists diverge, but on the evidence, on the data, on the observations, they should agree. And such data must be publicly visible, so science is an intrinsically transparent activity. The Copernican Revolution was what's called a paradigm shift. That's a violent or sudden or dramatic change in perception about some major issue in science. The scientific community was finally, at that time, receptive to the paradigm shift of the Earth not being the center of the universe. But we've seen that the primacy of evidence has been followed in other parts of science. For example, in the forgotten time where Islam was a major incubator of science, mathematics, and optics, we have this quote. The duty of the man who investigates the writings of scientists, if learning the truth is his goal, is to make himself the enemy of all that he reads and attack it from every side. He should also suspect himself as he performs his critical examination of it, so that he may avoid falling into either prejudice or leniency. That's a wonderful expression, 600 years before the European Renaissance, of the skepticism that's the heart of good science. The culmination of the Copernican Revolution was Newton's Law of Gravitation, and the magisterial book he wrote, primarily at the urging of Edmund Halley. Newton was not particularly interested in fame or celebrity, and he wasn't particularly interested in writing up his masterwork. But at the cajoling of Halley and others, he wrote what's called the Principia in shorthand. In 1687, the codification and the summation of all his thinking of gravity and his universal law of gravitation, which reproduced the motions and the three Kepler laws of planetary motion and is viewed as one of the most important scientific publications in history. Newton also, to develop this theory, had to invent calculus, and that's another aspect of modern science. Often scientists have to develop new tools, not only of logic and analysis and thought, but mathematical tools to do their work. The Copernican Revolution kicked off a set of discoveries that we'll summarize briefly that lead us to the present day view of the universe. The return of Halley's Comet, as mentioned, was a clear indication that Newton's law was correct, applied to an as yet unpredicted object. In 1838, we had the first measurement of the distance to a nearby star by the trigonometric method of parallax. Until then, it was actually not known how far away any of the stars were. Also in the 19th century was the measurement that showed that the Earth was actually in motion. Remember, it's a supposition of the heliocentric model, but actually proving that took te careful telescopic observations. Into the 20th century, and we have properties of stars that are finally used to measure distances beyond the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. A big debate in the 1920s, one side held that the Milky Way was all there was in the universe. The universe was the Milky Way, one system of stars, hundreds of thousands of light years in extent. The countervailing view was that some of the fuzzy patches of light in the sky, nebulae, were also distant systems of stars, island universes, to use the term. This debate was eventually resolved by Edwin Hubble, who showed that the Andromeda galaxy, or nebula, was a distant system of stars, like a twin of the Milky Way, at a distance of a couple of million light years. Another piece of cosmology came back from early in the 19th century, the Oliver paradox suggesting that there was a puzzle behind the fact that the sky is not bright in every direction. Because if the universe were infinite, eventually any direction in the sky should run into a star, and so the night sky should actually be lit up by the infinite number of stars in the universe. Fully understanding the resolution of Albert's paradox took the understanding of the expanding universe. 
which came also from Edwin Hubble. In 1929, Hubble proved that there was a correlation between the distance to galaxies and their recession velocity, or redshift. Remember, the recession velocity and redshift is measured using the spectroscopic tool that's at the heart of understanding exoplanets orbiting around stars. And then following from that came the idea of an expansion from a very small, dense, hot state, billions of years in the past, that was dubbed the Big Bang, actually by one of the critics of the theory, Fred Hoyle. It, it took another three decades for the theory, the Big Bang, to be affirmed by observations of the microwave background, essentially a dilute bath of radiation left over from the Big Bang. And so we have the modern era of science where it's taken us four centuries from the invention of the telescope to understand our place in a universe that's expanding, that's ancient, almost 14 billion years old, and that contains vast systems of stars, hundreds of billions of stars in each one, and about 100 billion systems of stars. This is a fantastic change of perspective, and it's a context because it's our understanding of our place in the universe and in astrobiology, we wonder, is it shared by anyone else? Carl Sagan, one of the giants of astrobiology, was hugely influential in the way we think about our position in space and time. He coined the phrase pale blue dot to describe the Earth as seen from afar, looking back from a space probe near the edge of the solar system. And he was so evocative, as you'll see, in describing this planet, our frailty as humans, and our position in the cosmic ocean. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish 
the pale blue dot. The only home we've ever known. The long progress of the Copernican Revolution continues until recent times. The Copernican Revolution served its role of displacing the Earth from the center of the universe and taking away the idea that it was unique. And in a sense, it sets the table for astrobiology and the discovery of exoplanets centuries later. In the continuing progression of the Copernican Revolution, it's a dramatic upheaval in social and political thought too, because it's disturbing to not be the center of the universe you live in. Science is led there by the scientific method based on deductive and inductive reasoning and the primacy of evidence. And in the modern extrapolation of the Copernican Revolution, we now realize that we occupy a tiny bit of unexceptional real estate in a vast and ancient universe.